or um, they have had, um, they're asymptomatic, but they're, they're waiting for test results. So um, you, you want to look through those three categories. That'll give the employee 100% compensation up to a cap uh, for the first two weeks, which is 10 working days. If you have the other three categories, which are they're caring for a person who's been quarantined um, so because of COVID or because they have no child care or school available because of COVID. And that one's starting to come back around again. Uh, you know, we had it in April and May where lots of employees needed to take that leave. Um, maybe some folks used all of their leave at that point in time and over the summer break and it's now been exhausted. Um, but some folks may have held on to it to see what, um, what might happen in the fall. And if schools go back to full virtual um, or even part virtual school, you may have higher numbers of employees coming and asking um, how, how many days they have left of that leave and how that benefit's going to work. So we have to work through the interplay of the FFCRA leave for the paid sick leave is easy. You get two weeks paid sick leave if you meet one of the criteria, done. That leave can be added on to your emergency FMLA, which is a separate category of FMLA, but it still only gives an individual a total of 12 weeks in a 12 month period for all FMLA reasons. So if you have an employee who was out say in January for two weeks because of a car accident, no matter what, they still only have 10 weeks left under FMLA. So it takes a lot to, to maneuver through the, the FFCRA leave, regular FMLA and emergency FMLA. Um, and then you throw in your normal PTO leave as well as any paid or unpaid leave or sick leave banks that you have. And it can be a little bit of a challenge to maneuver through. Um, just remember that employers can't double dip. You can't require an employee to take PTO and take the tax credit under the FFCRA leave. So it's one or the other um, for, that, for that benefit. Most of our clients uh, fall under the healthcare provider exemption. So you've not had to deal with FFCRA or emergency FMLA if you've chosen that exemption for your employees. It's an incredibly broad definition. The statute doesn't define healthcare provider. They just reference healthcare provider um, and then reference back to FMLA, but without giving a specific definition that we would traditionally see under FMLA, which would be a healthcare provider who can actually certify that an individual qualifies for FMLA leave. Those are MDs, DOs, nurse practitioners, and PAs. Under the FFCRA leave, healthcare provider exemption, they gave the, the Department of Labor issued a rule that gave an incredibly broad definition, which if you read the definition the way the rule is written, every member of our law firm meets the definition of healthcare provider because we provide on a contract basis services to people who provide healthcare. Um, so it's very, very broad. Um, and that definition has come under scrutiny lately. There is a New York court opinion that now says that the healthcare provider exemption should be limited to the normal traditional FMLA definition of healthcare provider. That opinion was not made as of today. It has not been made national. So it applies in New York, but it doesn't apply in Tennessee. So what does that mean for Tennessee healthcare provider employers? Well, it, it means that you have to be careful. Um, know that that exemption is under scrutiny. So contemplate whether you want to exercise it at all or whether you want to exercise it with some care. Um, and so it's one to look through. It's, it's a great one that if, if you're questioning whether or not you've, you want to start providing those benefits to employees that you have always exempted, give us a call and we can talk through those scenarios. But for right now, it's still a valid exception everywhere except in New York. Um, remember, you can take your tax credit. So you want to track any leave that is paid under the FFCRA paid sick leave or the emergency FMLA. Um, you take that off of your quarterly taxes um, for your payroll. And then um, you want, but you can't use the PPP loan money or your um, provider relief fund money to pay that FFCRA leave because you're getting the dollar for dollar tax credit. And then to also keep track as of right now, the FFCRA benefit is going to expire on 1231. Can't be carried over and they don't get paid out if they don't use it during that period of time. 
So let's talk non-COVID for just a minute. Um, part of, through the, the midst of all of this in May of this year, we got the final rule on the Fair Labor Standards Act on bonus compensation when you have a fluctuating workweek method of computing overtime. And lots of healthcare provider employees, lots of employers in general, but lots of healthcare employers have em multiple employees who fluctuate through time from one week they may have overtime, one week they may not, um, and they may have a base salary and then their hours fluctuate and they may be eligible for bonus compensation. They may also sometimes work night shifts and sometimes they don't. So you've got this fluctuating work week and you need to figure out how to calculate um, overtime compensation. It's been a question for a while. That rule comment period ended, so it became effective on August the 7th of, of this year. And what it does is it will allow an employer to offer bonus or other incentive compensation um, to employees who do have varying hours. So the rule clarifies that bonuses and um, incentive-based pay on top of a fixed salary are to be included when you're calculating that regular rate of pay for overtime calculations. And if you have the need, I'm not going to go into it today because it's a long convoluted, convoluted math problem, um, but it will give you in that August 31st opinion a good explanation of how to calculate that fluctuating work week method. So anybody that uses that on a regular basis and needs it, if you will shoot me an email, I will send you a copy of that August 31 DOL opinion that just came out that will give you that, um, that calculation and information. Um, what they do say is that you have to meet five criteria in order to use the fluctuating work week method. So I wanted to cover those. The employee's hours have to fluctuate from week to week. The new guidance clarifies is that they do not have to fluctuate both above and below 40 hours. They can fluctuate above 40 hours only and you can still meet that element, that criteria of the, um, of, the, of the new rule. The employee has to receive a fixed salary that doesn't vary with the number of hours worked. The amount of the fixed salary must meet the minimum wage requirements in the weeks that they work the greatest number of hours. Everybody, the employee and the employer, both have to have a clear understanding that this compensation, this salary, is for the total number of hours worked, that it is a true salary basis, and that in addition to the fixed salary, any bonuses, premium payments, commissions, that you do still pay that employee for overtime. That's a long way of saying that person is not overtime exempt. They don't meet the definition to be a salaried overtime exempt individual. So if you meet those five criteria, then you'll want to go over and look at the fluctuating work week method um, to evaluate how to do that. Um, so that's a, a nice non COVID um, a little moment of fresh air for just a minute. But now we're going to go right back into COVID again. Uh, so in August, we had an executive presidential memorandum on the deferral of Social Security tax withholding. And I got to tell you, it is Thursday, I think. And I feel like I have had this conversation a hundred times in the last four days because it went into effect on September the 1st and runs through 1231. We did finally get IRS guidance, um, it's limited guidance, but it's guidance on uh, over the weekend that essentially confirms that this is a, is a, it's a tax deferral. It is not a tax holiday. It is not tax forgiven. It is simply a deferral. It, it, it postpones the withholding of the employees, just the employees share of social security tax and from 9-1 through 12-31 until 1-1-21 through April the 30th. So you would take the total amount of tax that's withheld September through December, and then you divide that equally over your payrolls to, to, to pay that out and withhold then between January and April. The withholding though is only postponed if the employee's bi-weekly pay period wages is less than $4,000. If you pay on a monthly basis, so you know, you're, you're paid once every four weeks instead of once every two weeks, it'd be $8,000 and so forth. You just calculate that out. And you have to make that determination in each pay period. So you may have an employee because of their overtime or their shift differentials who some weeks meets the criteria for the postponement and some weeks they don't. So you just have to track that. 
Now, the number one question I've been getting constantly is, is this mandatory or voluntary? And my answer to that is, um, sure. I have no idea. I know that um, I have been talking to lots of our colleagues throughout the industry, lawyers, CPAs, trying to get a good handle on where folks believe this is. Consistently, I'm hearing that folks are taking this as voluntary. There's nothing in the executive memorandum or in the IRS guidance that I can see that says that it's mandatory. However, there's also nothing specifically in either that says without a doubt that it's voluntary. So at this point, that's the guidance that we're giving is industry leaders and folks with a lot more knowledge than I have are taking the position for the moment that we believe that it's voluntary. So an employer can choose to not participate. Um, but we could see additional guidance. I hope that we do. I hope that the IRS hears and reads all of the articles that I've been reading on um, on this issue for the past few days and give some additional guidance to make sure that it's clear for everybody because we are already in this first payroll period after September the 1st. Um, so that's our stay tuned. Um, and of course, we will send out one of our email blasts that we've been doing throughout the, the spring and summer this year if we get some definitive guidance um, on that. So that's all, that's all we have on the presidential memorandum at the moment. Um, one of the things that I have started doing because of COVID this year, I had never thought about a force majeure clause in an employment agreement until March of 2020. And then it became very clear that those might actually be helpful. Um, when you have employment agreements and you don't have work for them to perform, you may actually still have to pay your employees even though there's nothing to do depending upon the language of the employment agreement. You can't necessarily just uh, furlough them or, or, or terminate them outside of the confines of the employment agreement. Uh, so what we have started doing, and I'm now, now putting this in my form employment agreements, is to add a force majeure clause. And that force majeure language will allow the employer to suspend the employee's obligations to provide duties and services or to change or reduce their hours or to change or reduce their compensation. And I tie that to the compensation section so that the compensation is for all services rendered by the employee. Now, that's not been tested by court. It's not been tested by the Department of Labor, but what we've looked at is we feel like that should be a good mechanism in the event that you have an employee who has a, a definite term of employment and guaranteed employment under an employment agreement so that you don't just have to give notice of termination, that you would have the flexibility to be able to change the duties and the compensation in the event of another shutdown um, due to the pandemic. And we tailor the force majeure fairly close to where it's, it still gives the employee some level of confidence that they're not just really an employee at will with a written piece of paper that says that they have an employment agreement. You know, we tailor it to acts of God, pandemics, um, war, um, things that, that are truly out of the control of the employer. So we do recommend that everybody take a look at your employment agreements. Um, if you didn't have to take a look at your employment agreements during um, the beginning of the COVID shutdown in, in March, April, and May, then now would probably be a good time to take a look at those and just be prepared in case there's a second shutdown that were to come along the way. And then the last thing I want to talk about is what we always update every year. What's going on with the board? Um, what are the health related boards doing this year? Now, I will say COVID kept them a little quiet. Um, didn't, we, we didn't hear a whole lot there from March till about July. Um, some active investigations continued on, but not a lot of new investigations, um, not a lot of resolutions during that period of time. Um, but since July, we have seen a huge uptick. Um, and what are we seeing this, this year? Um, lots of drug tests. You know, Tennessee passed a statute a couple of years ago that if a healthcare provider fails a drug screen or refuses to take a drug screen, then the, then the employer of that healthcare provider has a duty to report that to the board. And that has really been on the upswing in the last 12 months. Um, I've probably had a dozen phone calls 
in the last year with providers of all kinds um, who have failed or been reported for refusing to take a drug screen. And the board has taken a pretty hard stance on that, that they believe that that is mandatory public discipline um, if, if those are, are proven to be true, that the drug screen was failed or refused. Um, and they're not giving us a lot of wiggle room on those um, based on the rules and on the statute. Uh, so so those are those are close. Now there are some rules. The rules do lay out when an employee, an employer has to report the individual. Um, so you want to make sure that if you're on the employer side that you pay close attention to whether or not you've you've exercised um, your all of the, the options that the employee has available to them before you send that report in. Um, they have an opportunity to go to 10 PAP or TMF and get assistance. If they do that within a certain number of days after being advised of the drug test, then you won't have to report them. You can just work with them or terminate them, but you wouldn't have an obligation to report. So it depends on the timing and on the actions and the response of the employee. Um, the other thing, thing I've seen an uptick in, um, in investigations this year has been a failure to report. Um, some providers have to report all arrests. Some only have to report convictions or guilty pleas. Um, some have to report where they have entered into a relationship with either TMF or TINPAP. Others don't. Uh, but it seems like there's a, 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 a lag or a delay or even a failure to report. And it's not the arrest or the conviction or the guilty plea or the agreement with the assistance organization that's creating the discipline it's the failure to just tell the board of what's going on. And, and so we're, we're, we're trying to make sure that we um, remind everybody to, to report anything that's going on that's necessary to be reported, as well as the pending investigation status. Once a provider has been contacted by a board investigator, they are pending investigation until that case is closed. And if it lasts long enough, and some, I've got some that are still sitting out there and they've been there for two years pending investigation. You may have to recredential with a hospital or an insurance carrier in that period of time. And you could have ramifications simply by neglecting to check the right box and report to the insurance carrier or the hospital that you have a pending matter. And that can create more trouble than the actual investigation that may ultimately get closed. Um, two of the other areas, you know, we've talked about opioid prescribing, I feel like for the last, for the entire eight years that we've been doing this. Um, but those seem to be on the uptick as well. Um, with fewer pain management providers in the state, there's higher scrutiny on the individual physicians and nurse practitioners and PAs who are still prescribing narcotics. So while you may not be in pain management, um, healthcare practices should be mindful of, of helping their providers and their prescribers to monitor um, their own prescribing histories to make sure there aren't anomalies, things aren't incorrect, and that they're not prescribing outside their group's standard of, of practice. Um, and the other interesting one I've seen several calls on lately are the use of stem cells. Um, so the board has taken a look at this. Um, haven't seen any discipline come from these yet, but I have seen some investigations across the state um, on just to check out why providers are using stem cells, what are they using it for, what's their justification, what advertising are they doing. So if that's in your practice might be something that you want to take a look at because it's one of those things that when we start to see a trend, we just want to let you know that, it, that it's out there. Um, so that is the end of, of my slides for the day. And I know Ian has got, he's going to pick us up from here um, to talk more about the employer, employee, independent contractor relationships and give us some good guidance on um, some other contractual matters. All righty. So <clears throat> let me pull up my screen real quick and we will go into the uh, exciting uh, portion <laughs> uh, dealing with peer review as a, as a great segue from what Jennifer was sharing uh, when it comes to um, uh, board discipline. So um, for those of you who have heard me speak at, at this seminar and, and elsewhere over the years, you know I come back to this topic over and over again, um, but it's worth uh, coming back to because uh, Tennessee really does have a very generous uh, statute when it comes to um, 
you know, QIC, you know, quality improvement and, you know, uh, the, the privilege that uh, pertains to that. So just to, to recap for those who uh, don't deal with the statute on a daily basis or a regular basis or, you know, are unfamiliar, uh, back in 2011, uh, Tennessee passed the Tennessee Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act and it made it state policy that they wanted to encourage um, providers to be able to evaluate, you know, their quality and uh, safety and other processes. And they should be able to do this in a safe environment where they can have candid discussions. Um, if you've ever been involved in a malpractice case, especially before the statute came out, uh, there was always a great fear uh, for especially the physician who had been um, uh, sued, you know, they, that they couldn't mention this to anyone, um, that they, they couldn't talk with their partners. Uh, it, would, it would open them up to being deposed uh, by the plaintiff's attorney. And so, you know, well, you know, what can you do? You're just kind of stuck talking to your attorney, um, which is not bad, but it's, it's not the same if you're a provider. So, um, what the state has done is come back and said, you know, we'll, we'll give you protection. But I think what's often missed about this particular statute, and I've put the, the, the statutory section there, is that it's not limited to a traditional committee. Um, uh, it certainly can be, um, but it also includes activities of a healthcare organization. Um, and it can be, you know, something that's done by one or more individuals that are employed by a healthcare organization. So you really have a lot of flexibility within this law to make QIC an activity and something that's, that is done beyond the bounds of a committee meeting that might happen once a year or once a month um, or, you know, on an ad hoc basis. So briefly, uh, and if you go to the statute, you'll, you'll see there, there are 16, um, at least 16 different um, uh, categories of what is included it doesn't necessarily limit uh, uh, the functions of a QIC to those um, uh, listed, but you know, what is uh, some of the things that are directly referenced in the statute, you know, as you would might expect, you know, evaluation and improvement of quality of care, um, and then, you know, determination of whether or not it met the standard of care. So that's where we come in, especially when it comes into a, a lawsuit or potential lawsuit. Um, but then also talks about, you know, intervention or support services. If you've got an impaired physician or someone that you're worried about, um, you know, in the past, you would have, you know, some concern that, well, if we have, if we discuss this openly, uh, can we, uh, will it come back to bite us? Well, now when you do things under the umbrella of uh, QIC, uh, the answer to that's no, that, 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 you know, as we'll see with the protections, uh, those are privileged. Um, and then activities to determine whether an organization is in compliance with state or federal regulations. Um, as you all know full well, both our, um, our physicians that are joining us today, as well as our uh, you know, administrators and, and medical group managers, um, that the scope of uh, state and federal regulations uh, just continues to grow exponentially. And even where we have maybe a, a decrease in the, in the regulations uh, in, in certain administrations, there's still a change. And so you still have to keep up with what those changes are. And so keeping, um, keeping up to date with that and having candid conversations about, well, where's our risk and how do we address this and how do we handle that is very important to a modern healthcare practice and, and, and providers. And so the Tennessee statute gives, uh, gives some, some latitude for those conversations, again, to be candid. So what's protected? Um, records of a QIC or, or testimony or statements relating to those activities are confidential and privileged. And so they're not subject to discovery in a lawsuit, a subpoena, uh, admission into evidence. Um, what that means is uh, records that are created by the committee. So the committee says, well, we want to look at uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Smith's services. Um, and so we're going to ask uh, Dr. Smith's nurse to come and, and talk to us uh, as part of that process. We'll talk, you know, ask Dr. Smith to talk about it. We may create a report uh, based off of that, uh, take some minutes of our meeting, general idea. Those are protected. Um, and then um, any person who supplies information or testifies, you know, would also be 
um, uh, protected from having to you know, provide testimony about those statements. So we really have a shield there, but as we'll see, it's not a total protection. So one of the questions I often get with groups that have gone in this direction and utilize a QIC under the statute is, well, can we, can we use this to protect everything? Um, and the answer to that's no. If, if you have records that are created outside of the QIC process, um, a perfect example would be a patient's medical record. You may talk about that medical record in your QIC meeting. Um, you may um, make some determinations on whether or not that record is, is up to par with the standard of care or with um, you know, documentation requirements, those types of things. Those notes would be protected. But if there's something glaring in the uh, medical record itself, you can't use the QIC process to somehow cloak that medical record uh, from discovery. So just be aware of that. That's, that's the general distinction that's being drawn in the statute. So again, you have certain immunity as well. Um, in addition to not you know, having um, records and, and the testimony of participants uh, you know, privileged and, and uh, not subject to uh, you know, uh, discovery or subpoena, you also have certain immunity. You, know, you make decisions or actions in these committees as long as they're being done in good faith and, and that's part of the statute as well. And there's a presumption of good faith um, that you know, you're protected from, um, from civil liability. Um, and then also providing information to those QICs. Again, the, the state really wants to incentivize um, these communications to be frank. And what I tell um, uh, a lot of our clients who've, who've considered this process and considered uh, adopting a QIC is you really want it to be two-way uh, street when it comes to communication. You want there to be an incentive for your people to raise issues so that you can address them. And I think that's fully within the statutory intent and the and the statement of the policy of the state of Tennessee to say, you know, we we want people to come with us with potential issues and then in return that's protected. Um, so you do need to outline how that process works. Um, and it's good to have a uh, record of, uh, you know, starting the QIC, whether that's part of your your bylaws or other corporate or LLC documents you may have as a practice. Um, and and it's usually best practices to have some kind of policy and, and written uh, parameters for how that's going to be set up and, and keep your uh, minutes and other documents separate from the rest of your, your corporate documents and, and minutes and other uh, records. But, um, you know, it really does uh, have a lot of advantages. So um, that's my uh, short, uh, you know, and for some of you a repeated uh, sermon on uh, on the QIC statute. And now I want to shift again into uh, some of that federal uh, regulatory space that we're, that we're seeing. Um, Jennifer uh, mentioned in her part of the presentation that, you know, while all the COVID-19 uh, uh, updates are going on and, and those are really happening uh, really in real time, um, uh, you know, we get new updates seemingly all the time. There have been some other significant updates uh, that have come across. And, and in addition to the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act uh, piece, you also have had in the past uh, few months uh, updates on the Affordable Care Act Section 1557. And as I'm sure, especially our, our uh, administrators are aware, um, the initial regulations for uh, Section 50, 1557 went into place uh, back in 2016, so towards the end of the Obama administration. Um, what they were doing was they were putting into uh, the, the regulations uh, the provision of the Affordable Care Act that provides that no individual will be barred from participation in or uh, being denied benefits of or subject to discrimination under any program or activity um, any part of which receives federal financial assistance. So this was a, a non-discrimination provision in the Affordable Care Act. So obviously that's passed back in 2010 and it takes them until essentially 2016 to, to get a final rule out there. So, and as you'll recall, both, you know, as, a, um, as folks who are involved in uh, 
healthcare practices on on kind of that administrative end, but also as a consumer of healthcare, you know, and and you know any kind of uh, health insurance documents that you receive, it seems it's very broad, but you um, get notices uh, about the non-discrimination um, provisions. There's also uh, statements in the top 15 languages of a state. Um, obviously, if you get um, uh, print communications, uh, that, ob that usually takes up a page or two um, of uh, kind of going down those, those taglines or, or notices about, you know, language assistance being available free of charge uh, for folks who need it. But the big uh, maybe headline uh, grabber uh, for um, the 1557 piece, at least when uh, the initial regulations were uh, released was its more expansive um, definition of discrimination on the basis of sex. And so under the uh, rule that was put forth by the Obama administration, uh, discrimination on the basis of sex included discrimination on the basis of pregnancy, false pregnancy, termination of pregnancy, or recovery uh, from, from their, uh, they're from, uh, childbirth and related medical conditions, and then sex stereotyping and gender identity. Um, when this came out, uh, there was a, um, you know, and this, we situate this within the broader context of uh, challenges that have come across in, in the last few years to different aspects of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Um, and so this was, this was no different. We had a, um, a group of plaintiffs that were it, it was states and then some religiously affiliated plaintiffs that in the Franciscan Alliance, uh, v. Burwell, at least v. Burwell at the time, uh, was filed down in federal district court in Texas. And what the court ended up doing was it enjoined HHS, uh, prevented it from enforcing uh, the parts of the 1557 rule that explicitly prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender identity and uh, termination of pregnancy. And, you know, without getting into the convoluted uh, case history, uh, that would be maybe more of a, a topic for, for uh, lawyers, um, the, the outcome, or at least the interim outcome, was that the court basically said to HHS, okay, you can go and revise this rule. Um, and, and make it more palatable, but, you know, did not uh, adopt or allow the HHS to um, uh, enforce the provisions that were had that more expansive uh, vision of what discrimination on the basis of sex meant. So we fast forward, of course, all of that is happening in 2016, um, right ahead of a presidential election. And then here we are in 2020 and, um, the Trump administration uh, issues its final rule amidst, um, you know, kind of our, our summer of dealing with COVID-19 uh, related updates in the law and, and regulations. And this, this grabbed a few headlines, um, uh, but um, not as much as, you know, maybe the PPP program or the Provider Relief Fund, at least within uh, the physician uh, and medical community. But um, so the HHS, the, it, it releases the new final rule on uh, June 12th. Um, and the big headlines, again, from that release, uh, and, and that rule is out there now, uh, you can review it on the HHS website, but it uses a more traditional understanding of what discrimination on the basis of sex means. Um, what their, their phrase for it was that they're using the plain meaning of male and female, not, uh, and then, you know, not including kind of the concept of gender identity. Um, and they also in this new rule, reduce some of the requirements on uh, non-discrimination notices and tagline translations. Uh, they kind of, they limited the number of uh, documents you need to put that on and they also reduced somewhat the scope of the entities that needed to do that. They tried to tailor it more towards uh, those who are directly involved in the provision of healthcare or receiving funds from HHS. So that's June 12th and then completely in keeping with the pace of change that's been going on in 2020. Um, three days later, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court issues its decision in, in Bostock versus uh, Clayton County, Georgia. And uh, as, as you may be aware at the time, 
uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, majority opinion uh, expanded uh, the, its interpretation of discrimination on the basis of sex to include discrimination against homosexual and transgender persons, uh, at least within the employment relationship. Uh, the, the two cases that were uh, reviewed as part of that decision dealt with employment uh, decisions um, where employers had um, uh, discriminated against uh, their employees on, on those bases. And so um, the key language from the majority opinion um, was that it is impossible to discriminate against a person for being homosexual or transgender without discriminating against the individual based on sex. So um, to borrow from uh, the legendary New York Yankees catcher Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. Um, we have a uh, federal district court this time in New York um, uh, earlier or mid part of last month uh, enjoining HHS from enforcing the new final rule on section 1557. Uh, and the district court citing the Bostock uh, decision as a change in the understanding of the discrimination based on, on the basis of sex. And so here we are again in an election year and, um, you know, uh, we're, we're kind of more or less in limbo again. So what happens now if you are, um, uh, you know, trying to, to look for direction on how to, you know, what rule to um, uh, comply with? I think we're more or less on a wait and see mode, um, kind of continue on what you're doing. Um, the, the district court did uh, enter its um, uh, decision before the new uh, final rule was to, to uh, begin being enforced. Um, and so as I would imagine with uh, other matters relating to this section of the uh, Affordable Care Act and others, there will continue to be court challenges, appeals, it may end up at the you know Supreme Court before it's all over. We're also in an election year. You may not have uh, noticed, uh, but you know we are in a presidential election year, and um, so depending on what happens in November um, or with that election, we could have a new administration that takes a different uh, different approach uh, to to this question, uh, or if if it is the same administration in a in a second uh, uh, term. You know, what does that look like in wake of uh, the decision by the New York District Court? So stay tuned is the best I can say right now. Um, but why is this important? You know, why are we, why are we highlighting this as part of our um, update? Well, this is another one of those areas where you, you, do, you think you need to flag it going forward. Regardless of how 1557 uh, is, is interpreted, how the final rule is ultimately enforced. Um, you know, the, the field of LGBT health and therefore LGBT health law is one of those emerging areas. Um, and um, I know there are, you know, attendees today that I've, I've spoken with over the last few years where, um, you know, it's, it's not merely, you know, we can talk about kind of the high level uh, concept of discrimination and non-discrimination, but there's some very important implications for a healthcare practice that need to be um, uh, thought through, uh, sometimes on a on a case by case basis. One that uh, has come up over the years is for transgender persons who, um, you know, transition. Um, sometimes there is a request for an amendment of uh, their medical record. And so what is an appropriate amendment of that medical record and what's maybe not? What, what needs to be maintained for continuity of care or making sure that, you know, any kind of, you know, condition or potential condition is addressed. Um, and so there, there are, you know, downstream issues, you know, it, it, it can be also practical things like forms and, and how um, one relates with a practice's patients, but um, it, it goes fairly well into the, um, you know, the implications on, on you know, just compliance uh, with healthcare um, laws and regulations beyond merely section 1557. So I, I, would, I would flag that and, you know, um, just as, as something, if, if you've not considered those things before, um, to, to maybe, you know, have that on your radar that um, all indications are that this area of uh, healthcare and healthcare law will just continue to uh, grow over uh, the years to come. So 
Um, next, I wanna talk about independent contractors. This is um, probably in, uh, as far as uh, emerging and exciting areas of the law, this is probably down the list, but I think it's important for uh, providers and, and practices, especially practice administrators who may be dealing, especially with the employment side and all the logistics of that, that includes, to, to be aware of this. So um, just a, a quick refresher, uh, you know, independent contractors are different uh, from employees uh, in that, you know, the, the practical implication is, you know, for, for employees, you have to withhold income taxes, uh, Social Security, Medicare taxes, you know, pay unemployment taxes on wages paid. Um, you also have um, more of a concept of vicarious liability um, if uh, for the actions of an um, of employee. So if, if someone uh, commits malpractice or otherwise damages uh, someone and they're in the acting in the course of scope, course and scope of their employment, then there can usually be um, uh, potential liability for the uh, the employer as well. Um, and as a general rule, an individual is an independent contractor if the company um, has the right to control only the result of the work, but not um, what will be done or how it will be done. Um, that's that's kind of the, the very generalized understanding of the distinction. So you may have uh, been made aware of this or may not. Again, there's been a lot of other headlines uh, uh, this year, and this one is, is probably not one that uh, they're going to have a news break on, on uh, the local uh, news stations to talk about. But Tennessee has changed its approach to you know, how uh, it looks at independent contractors and what, what qualifies uh, a, a member of your personnel to be, um, you know, an independent contractor. So previously they used what was called the ABC test and I've got it listed out there for fairly straightforward, just, you know, do, do they fit these criteria? Um, that has been replaced with the uh, IRS 20 factor test that was uh, made effective um, basically, we've incorporated that that concept uh, starting in January, uh, January one of 2020, and I've got the website uh, there. If you if you Google, uh, you know the Tennessee uh, Independent Contractor, you know 2020 or you know 2020 change or the 20 factor test, you, you'll find this page. But um, you know, and it goes through the various factors. Um, we we don't have the time to go through all of those. Plus, we um, it's probably not practical to go through all of those because this, again, is a very uh, case by case basis type test. Um, not all of the factors are, you know, weighted equally. And depending on the scenario, it just, you know, um, uh, different uh, issues are going to be implicated. So, uh, but be aware of that. Um, and, you know, the Tennessee Department of Labor is going to examine the factors and apply, you know, the relationship in making the determination. Now, the new rule is seen as more employer friendly, um, but um, what I've seen in, um, in my practice is that uh, sometimes you'll have providers, especially who are interested in being an independent contractor. Um, a lot of times there are perceived financial benefits to that uh, tax planning or, you know, just other, you know, uh, other reasons why they, that for whatever reason that's important to them, they want to try to be an, an independent contractor as opposed to employee. Um, and while, you know, again, this is something that we look at on a case by case basis, you as a group, if you're an administrator or if you're in, in uh, leadership in your practice as a, as a physician, need to be aware that there's potential consequences out here for, for the practice. So, you know, you've, you've got potential liability for employment taxes. You've got potential FLSA claims for unpaid wages. So they could request this, but then come back and um, make an FLSA claim against you. Um, there can be, you know, depending on the circumstances, EEOC or THRA claims regarding uh, discrimination. There can be, you know, penalties uh, by the state, by the Department of Labor for uh, misclassification. Um, and so, and then of course, paying unpaid state taxes, um, you know, uh, that were not taken out um, as well. And so, you know, your relative risks and benefits, if you are the individual provider who's requesting this versus the group um, that is um, 
you know, retaining or, or utilizing the services of this provider, your, your risks are, are not necessarily aligned. Um, and and the, the group is potentially in for a little bit more consequence uh, than, the, um, than the provider is. And at least when you're looking at it from your perspective, I think, you know, you've got um, some issues that you just need to be very aware of before you go down that route. So, and then here's some more, you know, potential consequences. You've got, you know, again, the back taxes and, and uh, payroll, uh, Social Security, Medicare, et cetera. So I would say as a general rule, um, if, you're, if you have a situation where um, you're going to have physicians, especially um, where most of your physicians are W-2, and then you're going to have one 1099, um, that's going to potentially raise a red flag. You know, if, if it's a you know, locum situation or kind of a one-off that you know, is kind of justified, um, that's, that's one thing. But if it's just everyone's doing the same thing, really in the same boat, just one person is 1099 or two people are 1099 and everyone else is W-2, it's going to set off a red flag. And so it's been our experience that the Department of Labor in Tennessee does monitor this um, and, and they will um, regularly send out, um, you know, when they've done their kind of analytics on it, they will, they will subject uh, employers to audit and, and review this stuff. And then that turns into its own uh, mess. And so um, or at least potential mess. So be aware of this. It's it, again, it's not one of those topics right now that is uh, getting a lot of headlines, um, especially with the the COVID piece. Uh, but um, just be aware of it if and when it, it comes up for your practice that you know uh, you need to look at that twenty factor test to begin with, and then also you need to really analyze whether or not this is really worth you know any risk that we might be taking on. So. With that, um, that is the um, end of my uh, uh, presentation um, with respect to um, the um, uh, employment law and, and, and other matters. I think at this point we can um, take some questions if folks have them. I see we've got a few um, in our uh, Q&A box and thank you again for using that Q&A feature. Um, so let's see. Um, first question, and Jennifer, this might be one for you. Um, the question is, uh, should practices be doing drug, scheme, drug screens regularly on providers, including partners? So I think that's up to the group to do that. Now you do, if you want to be a, become a drug-free workplace, then an employment group can, um, can do that. And the, um, a, sort of a discount off of your um, unemployment insurance premiums if you if you do that. But there's no obligation to drug test unless um, you have a have a concern that perhaps the, the provider is impaired. So uh, now do most of our groups, most of our clients, um, I would think most of them do drug trust the drug testing, especially uh, of their clinical providers. Um, but it's not mandatory in the state of Tennessee right now. Okay. Um, our, we've got another question and, and um, Jennifer, this, this may be for you, but also acknowledging that it's, it's a little bit of an overlap on one of our future sessions coming up actually in two weeks uh, on uh, COVID-19 legal updates. But uh, the question is when you exhaust your PPP loan money, can you then apply for tax credits on uh, FFCRA pay? Well, I guess we'll do it as a teaser then for the program coming up in two weeks. My understanding is yes. Once you've exhausted all your PPP money, um, you could actually have FFCRA leave benefits and get the payroll tax while you still have PPP funds available. You just can't use the PPP funds um, to pay for that, that payroll. Um, so you couldn't include that in your PPP payroll calculation, but you could still pay them both at the same time. Great. Well, um, we still have a few moments for questions, but while we wait to see if any others will, will pop up, um, for, for those who have signed up and registered for this program, this of course is session one. Um, the next session will be at the same time next week uh, on Thursday the 10th, and it will be entitled Year in Review. 
Um, the, uh, the year in review will cover topics uh, ranging on especially federal, but also uh, I believe some state uh, regulatory enforcement um, uh, and kind of the climate that we're in and, and, and as usual uh, things to look out for. Uh, our presenters for that will be uh, Dan Swanson, uh, Patty Cotton, and Aaron Williams in our office. And so if you've attended in the past, you know uh, they typically give that update and they'll be doing it again this year. Um, and if you have questions in advance of that, I'll be sending out a reminder, just like we did for this session regarding uh, the, the outline for the session, as well as Zoom instructions for joining. Um, if you have any questions in advance of their um, uh, presentation, when you see the outline, please feel free to email those and, and be happy to pass those along to the presenters to try to work into their uh, presentation. Um, but in the meantime, um, you know, we're again, very uh, glad to have you. Um, the, the, the other session I should say before uh, or after next week's will be, uh, we'll wrap it up on our third session on September 17th and that will be the COVID-19 legal update. And so we will be covering uh, topics ranging from the PVP loan program, the provider relief funds, I should say at this point, since there are multiple provider relief funds uh, and other uh, matters that have come up and especially how the, the various uh, uh, programs and regulations uh, interact with each other. So um, I'm seeing no other questions. So. Uh, I think we'll end it there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next week at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 uh, Central. Thank you so much.